Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is a joint hearing between Senate Judiciary, House Judiciary, and House Institutions. And we're taking up the uh, report from Council of State Governments on Just Justice Reinvestment II. Uh, and we have Sarah Friedman with us from Council of State Governments. She's agreed to lead off and uh, do all the technical uh, moves necessary to get us through. And then she'll introduce her colleague, David, as we go forward. Um, I, I'll just say before we start that uh, it seems best to hold questions. Otherwise, we'll, we'll not wind up getting all the way through the report. So unless there's something uh, genuinely pressing, let's just write questions down and have them at the end. If you do need to get my attention, putting up the little blue hand um, or, or even raising your hand, uh, but the little blue hand will get to me regardless of which screen you're on. So with that said, um, please take it away, Sarah. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you everyone for being here. Uh, really, David and I um, are really excited to present this report to you. Um, I am Sarah Friedman. I'm a Deputy Program Director at the Council of State Governments Justice Center. Uh, with me co-presenting is David DeMora, who's a Senior Policy Advisor at the Council of State Governments Justice Center. Um, when his time uh, turn is up, I'll introduce him and, and you'll, you'll hear from him more closely, specifically around work that CSG has been helping Vermont do around substance use and mental health needs in Vermont. Um, we're here today to present uh, the Justice Reinvestment to Working Group report that was submitted to the legislature on January 15th. And um, I know there's a lot of folks uh, here right now. Um, some folks have been more, some of you all have heard me present before. Um, you've, you've kind of heard the material more often, and I assume that so it will be newer for other people. So I'm going to try to balance kind of doing the, a lot of folks have he been here before, but it might be new. I'm going to try to balance kind of how in-depth I go into the report. It's pretty lengthy. Um, it's in four sections. Uh, actually five sections, I should say. Um, I, I don't know if you all might have it in front of you, but I will also actually right now be putting it up. It's a PowerPoint presentation that I'll, walk, uh, that I'll begin to walk through with you all. So if you bear with me, I'm going to um, share my screen. Um, let's see. And um, all right. Can All right, can everyone see this? Yes. Okay, I see some nodding heads. So just so you all know, um, I can only see a couple of you as I'm presenting this. Um, I know that we've been asked to hold questions uh, till the end, but if you all need to get my attention, it may take a little, a little bit because of the way presenter mode works on Zoom. So, um, to begin this, the report that was submitted to you all is in five sections. Um, I'm gonna go through many of them. David will really focus on the third section, the analysis of mental health and substance use disorders for folks in Vermont. But first I'll just walk through you through kind of background on who the Justice Right Investment Working Group is and what work they did. Then we're gonna talk about the conversation um, that was had uh, on probation earned credit policies. Uh, David will talk to you all about behavioral health policies, um, and then we'll walk through uh, some reinvestment of budgetary recommendations that were made um, and just uh, thinking through moving forward for the working group is the last section. So uh, as I hope many people here remember, this is all coming out of a justice reinvestment process. So in June 2019, state leaders from all three branches of government wrote to the federal government, the Department of Justice, Bureau of Justice Assistance, and requested that the Council of State Government Justice Center come into Vermont, analyze your criminal justice system to look at what challenges and needs were going on within the criminal justice system, and help the state propose policy options to address those challenges. 
this was a, a process. You all may uh, remember my colleague, Ellen Whelan Wiest, a, a fellow Vermonter who led this process um, uh, throughout uh, the end of 2019 and early 2020 that really culminated in Act 148. So um, pretty incredible, despite everything going on with the pandemic, um, you, <laughs> the legislature figuring out how to switch to Zoom, all of the other pressing challenges, um, really a credit to your legislative leadership and leadership in the state that there was still coming out of this process in the middle of the, the kind of state chaos was a really significant criminal justice reform bill in Act 148. This was enacted in July 2020. And here we have just a really, really high level brief overview of everything in Act 148. Kind of the three, three of the hallmark policies were establishing pre presumptive parole, streamlining your furlough system, which is um, a system for supervising people in the community by the Department of Correction, and incentivizing good behavior for people who are incarcerated or on furlough by increasing earned good time. Um, as, part of, uh, as part of these policies, Act 148 continues the Justice Reinvestment II working group. So the working group oversaw, during what we call phase one of Justice re Reinvestment, it oversaw all of this, this analysis and policy development. And in Act 148, uh, the uh, legislative leader said, hey, we want this to continue. We found a lot of value in this working group process, and we would like the working group to oversee implementation of these policies passed in Act 148, and also to study some additional policy areas that we weren't quite able to kind of get over the hill during the last legislative session. And so that's why we are here today. So what this looked like, just um, for you all to understand the work that the working group put in is that um, once the bill was enacted in July, uh, leaders from all three branches of government again got together, wrote a letter to the Department of Justice, Bureau of Justice Assistance and said, hey, could CSG please stay on and keep facilitating this process for us? That letter was approved in August. Um, and then that's when things kind of really got going in earnest. And the working group was able to meet four times between September and that January 15th reporting deadline that's in Act 148 for the first, first report that's due, which you are, all are reviewing now. Now the working group that was continued in Act 148 is 19 members. Um, it's the same members that, that were there during the initial part of the process before Act 148 was enacted with the addition of a representative of the parole board, which is Mary Jane Ainsworth um, added to the working group. Just wanna note here, there are four legislators on this working group. Um, I think all of, or almost all, maybe not since Senator Sears wasn't able to attend are actually in this meeting now. So we have folks who experienced this firsthand who are hearing me talk again, <laughs> um, Representative Emmons, uh, Representative Grad, uh, Senator Nitka, and then of course, uh, Senator Sears, who couldn't be here at this moment. But you'll also see in these 19 members, again, as, as Justice Reinvestment always is, representatives from all three branches of government um, and a variety of different actors within the criminal justice system. So folks who really understand the system, being able to uh, kind of give input and direction into where the work is going. So in addition to just generally overseeing justice reinvestment implementation, the working group um, was tasked within Act 148 for studying specific policy areas. Um, and the working group has to report, uh, has the January 15, 2021 report, which you are reviewing now, and then also a report due January 15, 2022, and a long list of duties in between. Some of those duties were marked that they had to be done by 2021, but there was also some flexibility where the working group could look at their timeline and figure out what they wanted to prioritize for this first report and what they really wanted to tackle in fall of 2020 and this kind of pretty quick timeline that they had to execute before the report was due. So uh, at the first meeting they met, they looked at these duties and they really prioritized four statutory tasks for the, this report. Um, the first, and this one had to be done uh, by, by January 15, 2021, was studying earned time for people on probation and, and exploring other related policy options. 
The next three are the three that David DeMora is going to get into when he presents his section of the report, but they're all related to substance use and mental health challenges in the state, and in particular uh, related to kind of um, uh, information sharing across agencies, uh, coordinated care and collaboration, um, and assessment tools, and making sure that everyone is kind of rowing the boat together when addressing the needs uh, of people in the criminal justice system who have mental health and substance use needs. So we'll get into a lot more detail on these um, in section three of this presentation. So what this looked like is that the working group was able to meet four times um, before the report was due in which they, they tackled these tasks that I just outlined and also looked into what they thought budgetary recommendations could be related to strengthening justice reinvestment policies um, and thought through what um, policy options they might want to present for action during the legislative session or for administrative action, so things that did not necessarily need to become legislation. Um, I'm not going to go through <laughs> exactly what they did in each, uh, in each meeting in detail, um, but you'll see here kind of the general flow of the meeting. Um, one thing I do want to note is that this report is a culmination of these four meetings. And so the report that you're looking at now really kind of cherry picks the highlights of the four presentations that were presented during these meetings to give an kind of that um, overview of everything the working group tackled, while also trying to not get in too much detail or be, you know, too onerous to read. So if there are aspects when I'm presenting and you're thinking, oh, I'd really like more detail on that. You, there might actually be more detail and there are four separate presentations that this kind of consolidates into. Um, so just to note there, and I can also flag or if you have questions, you know, I might be able to point you to the right detailed um, presentation that would give you more information on what you're what you're wondering about. But we tried to be at least a bit brief for the this kind of culminating report. Um, also important to know, if you're wondering where to access those presentations, there's actually a Justice Reinvestment 2 website that's up on the Judiciary's page um, where all of the materials from the meetings are posted as well, along with the YouTube videos um, because everything was live streamed. So there's a lot more materials on the Justice to Reinvestment 2 working group if you all are interested. So now I'm going to dive into the probation earned credit midpoint review conversation um, that the working group undertook um, uh, during this process. Now, there's a few things going on here. One, a lot of uh, several folks, I should say, um, who are listening now have already heard me present this. <laughs> um, and then also, and, and, uh, uh, and then also, as folks have already heard me present this too, this part of um, the work that the working group did is a little bit uh, different than CSG Justice Center's normal process. So I'm gonna um, try to do this pretty high level and pretty quickly so that folks who have already heard this aren't, aren't kind of twiddling their thumbs, but you know, please, uh, if folks have clarifying questions and they don't wanna wait to the end, let me know if I'm kind of going through it more quickly. Um, especially with the data, I'm going to try to do that really high level, but know if you have data questions, we have additional analyses available and, and have the ability to go more in depth if needed. So Act 148 tasked the working group with evalu evaluating the policy for people on probation uh, earning one day of credit towards their, towards their suspended sentence for each day served in the community without a violation. And the Act 148 actually goes into pretty specific details about exactly what the working group should consider with this probation policy. So they ask, as it says, working group, we want you to look at how to implement this policy without impacting probation term or suspended sentence length, whether credit should apply to both maximum and minimum suspended sentences, whether credit cruel uh, equal to the imposed or statutory maximum terms should result in discharge, et cetera. Um, I won't bother to read the other ones because you all get the point, but there's some very specific details they have to do. Now, uh, CSG Justice Center was really happy to help, um, to help the working group think this through, facilitate it, look at what data was available. But as I said, it's a little outside of our normal process because it didn't 
the um, this is a conversation that I understand has been going on to, in Vermont for for many years now. Whether or not people on probation should earn a credit um, should earn credit for good behavior. And so it wasn't a, it wasn't kind of a, a policy that came out of our phase one data analysis like the other policies that informed Act 148. But actually, we were stepping into kind of an ongoing conversation within Vermont about this. Um, and we had and, and we are working to navigate that to help Vermonters figure out where they want to go. Um, meaning that we're kind of a little a bit less directive than maybe you've seen us be in the past around this policy because of um, because it's an ongoing conversation, because you'll see we didn't have all the data we wanted to to answer all the questions we wanted. And um, just kind of generally for quite honestly, the political sensitivity of it, we kind of could tell you as much as we knew, but we kind of but we couldn't tell Vermonters exactly the best way way forward, quite honestly. So um, this you'll see uh, when we presented policy options to the working group, which we'll review in just a minute. Usually when we present policy options, we are, we are saying, hey, we really want you to adopt all of these. But it was different for us. Instead, we said, hey, you know what, here's, here's two different routes you can go. And we can tell you kind of the pros and cons of each route, but we can't, we can't say like, you should definitely take this path or you should definitely take this path. This is like a very kind of Vermont specific decision that needs to be made. So when thinking through this conversation, um, we, and thinking through kind of this, like this ongoing conversation in Vermont, uh, CSG staff wanted to work with the working group to think through what their goals are of an earned uh, credit policy for folks on probation um, and, and have that conversation with the working group to best figure out how uh, to kind of craft a policy moving forward. And, and through this conversation, the working group really identified four different goals that a, um, that a probation earned credit policy might address. So decreasing the length of incarceration for people who are successful on probation and then revoked to prison for a period, decreasing the probation term for people who are successful on probation, um, providing people on probation with an increased incentive for positive behavior change, and then also increasing probation resources for those focus, to focus for those most likely to reoffend. And, and the idea by, about that one specifically is if you have a whole bunch of people who are successful on probation and they earn their discharge, they are able to short, get, earn shorter sentences on probation. So you get all of those people who are really successful, who are doing well in the community off the probation rolls, then your probation officers who are um, providing supervision to people on probation, they are left with the people who are struggling, who are at higher risk to commit future crimes, et cetera, and they can really focus their resources, their time and attention on those folks who, um, who are not being successful on probation. So this is one of these places in this report where there's a lot more detailed charts for folks who are really quantitatively minded in CSU's second presentation to the working group. But for this report, we kind of picked the greatest hit. And because a lot of folks on this committee have heard me uh, talk about all these numbers, I'm gonna go through them pretty quickly. Um, but what we wanted to do, what the CSG team wanted to do um, when helping Vermont think through, you know, what a probation earned credit policy could look like and what the needs were there was, well, what does your, what do your probation sentences currently look like? You know, what data can we go, can we show you to tell you what's happening for people who are currently on probation? And so the next few slides will represent that analysis, looking into the current probation population and, and what sentence lengths look like. Um, it's really important to note, um, and I have a feeling almost everyone who I'm talking to knows this already, but just in case, probation sentences have three components um, in Vermont specifically. So uh, judges sentence someone to a length on probation, so a length um, being supervised in the community by uh, supervision officers. But then they also sentence people to a minimum and maximum underlying sentence. So, so that minimum and maximum underlying sentence tell, says uh, how long essentially someone can be incarcerated when they mess up on their probation and if they're revoked to prison. 
Um, and so those are the three, those are the three kind of components of a probation sentence. And that's what we break down in these following slides is what those, those three different components of a probation sentence look like for misdemeanors and for felonies. So for misdemeanor probation sentences, generally uh, judges put people on probation for 24 months or less, which makes sense because there's guidance on the books that unless you know, there's uh, a real reason to exceed 24 months, misdemeanor probation sentences should not be longer than, than 24 months. Um, for those underlying min and max sentences for misdemeanor probation, um, they tend to be significantly shorter than the actual amount of time someone is placed on probation. So for example, from this chart, if you're uh, for a person, for a typical person who's placed on probation for one year, their underlying minimum and maximum sentence, that underlying amount that they can be incarcerated is three to six months. Now for felonies, nearly all felony probation sentences are less than five years. Um, you'll see here in this chart, there's these spikes. Those spikes are kind of, for the most part, at the year mark at 24 months, at 36 months, 48 months, et cetera. Um, there is uh, statutory guidance that probation sentences should generally not exceed four years, but we do see that you know a, a chunk of people in Vermont do get probation sentences for four or five years. For the underlying minimum maximum sentences, the underlying suspended incarceration sentence for people on felony probation, it looks actually pretty different um, than misdemeanor probation. So um, those incarceration sentences are generally the same length as the probation term if someone gets probation sentences of an over two years. But for folks uh, with probation sentences of two years or less, their actual underlying of incarceration, sentence of incarceration is actually longer than tends to be longer than um, than the amount they're sentenced to prison. So, and if you look across all different felony probation lengths, so across all felony sentences, the medium under median underlying sentence uh, is one to three years of incarceration. So, really important if you all are thinking, you know, are people successful on probation? Should they earn time off? their probation sentence for being successful, it's really important to understand, uh, well, when do people mess up when they're on probation? You know, uh, when, if someone is revoked on probation, when does that happen in their probation term? Um, and so for misdemeanor probation, for misdemeanor probation sentences, it occurs, tends to occur well within someone's first half of their probation term. So from this chart, for example, if you have a probation term of one year, uh, the typical person who, if, if someone has a probation term of, of one year and messes up on their probation, they typically do that in the fifth month um, of their probation term. And as probation sentence, misdemeanor probation sentences get longer, you see that it, incurred, it occurs kind of even earlier within the probation term. So if you're someone who got four years of misdemeanor probation, um, you would mess up in the, you would typically, and you're someone who messes up on probation, that would typically happen in the ninth month. Of, of your uh, probation term. So across all different misdemeanor probation sentences, um, the average person who is revoked, uh, has their supervision revoked, is revoked in their seventh month of supervision. So um, for felony probation, this actually doesn't look so dissimilar. Again, it's typically within the first half of a felony probation sentence um, across all different felony sentence lengths. Uh, the average person who is revoked would be revoked in their 11th month of supervision. So um, most people who get revoked uh, do so within the first year of their probation sentence. And this chart shows you, well, based on how the length of sentence exactly where people, people are typically revoked. So um, we, the CSG team didn't really have the data available to us to, to answer all the questions we would have wanted to answer to fully understand a probation earned credit policy. Um, there, we, we know that there are already two mechanisms on the books in Vermont that allow people to, short, to earn um, time off their, off their probation sentences. One is called the midpoint review. The other is just uh, that there is a policy that once people complete this the um, complete the conditions of their supervision, DOC can petition the court to shorten their probation sentence. But 
we had no idea how often those two mechanisms were used um, uh, and, you know, whether how often they were used or how often they were approved by the judiciary. Um, we don't know how often and for how long probation terms are extended as a result of a violation. Um, we weren't able to see the imposition of minimum and maximum suspended sentences, how that correlates with the amount of time someone spends in prison on a revocation, et cetera. So we didn't really feel like we had the full picture um, in order to provide kind of this directive guidance on exactly the best way to craft a probation policy. However, um, do want to note that 38 states across the country have some sort of earned compliance credit or earned discharge policy for people on community supervision. Um, so this is a really common policy nationally, and a lot of states have seen success with it, even if we don't know exactly, uh, even if, you know, we don't know exactly how it could look in Vermont. So even though we didn't have this data, uh, actually, really interestingly, um, the, the working group really dug into the probation earned credit policy, discussing it uh, in their uh, um, October and November meetings. And then in December, like two weeks after the last time they discussed it, uh, Pew released a really comprehensive study on these policies specifically. Um, and that study did find that nationally, many people on supervision serve longer terms than are necessary for public safety, and that many states have enacted these policies and not had negative impacts on public safety. Um, and so it's a really interesting report. I think I've sent, we've sent it um, to the Senate Judiciary Committee, but we can make sure that everyone has access to it if you all are interested. It walks through all these different policies nationally and gives case studies on states that have found success with them. And at the end, it really concludes, um, well, the study recommends to state policymakers um, that they should adopt similar policies to what the working group had been discussing. And in particular, it, it highlights three different aspects of policies that it thinks uh, that kind of Pew thinks research really supports. So um, enacting policies that have goal-based supervision to prioritize outcomes as opposed to time-based supervision, um, earned compliance credits to promote positive behavior and encourage compliance and increase successful supervision, and automated automatic review of supervision to ensure that states use clear and definable guidelines to determine eligibility for earned discharge to ensure fairness. So all three things that the working group really did dive into and discuss. So uh, at the end of this discussion and in the January meeting for the working group, CSG really put together two policy options for the working group to consider that were based on where we heard the conversation going during the, um, the October and November meetings. Um, so really following where we felt like the working group was kind of forming consensus and the two different types of policies that the working group had discussed in those meetings. So we were kind of articulating back to the working group where we thought they were going. Um, the first of these options was to do to kind of um, adopt the probation earned credit policy, the day for day credit that uh, Act 148 asks um, the working group to study. And, and it seemed like when discussing this credit, where the working group was landing was to apply uh, the, the credit to the underlying minimum sentence. Um, and then there were also some conversations of applying it to the underlying minimum sentence until there were only 15 or 30 days remaining of incarceration so that if someone could be revoked if needed um, rather than their minimum sentence going down to zero and kind of that removing the tool of revocation. Um, ultimately, this option was not adopted by the working group, um, but there was comment and, and that should and that should be to say that we did present this, CSG did present this as, hey, we think you should do option one or option two. Um, and representation from the ACLU stated that, um, uh, stated that, you know, they didn't think that option one and two were mutually exclusive, that the working group could have adopted both. Which I guess uh, at least lets the cat out of the bag that the working group did adopt option two. Um, and this was based on conversations that the working group had around the midpoint review process, which is a mechanism Vermont already has on the books to shorten people's probation sentences if they um, are being successful on probation. So um, 
that's at the midpoint review, at the midpoint of someone's probation sentence, DOC right now can petition the report, uh, uh, can petition the court to discharge the remainder of someone's probation sentence. And this is really kind of where consensus felt like it was going um, in the working group discussion. So um, the, uh, the kind of recommendation from CSG was to modify the midpoint review process to make this more presumptive and encourage its use using a model of earned discharge policies from other states such as Montana. And this is to say that although it's not in the working group report, uh, the working group did review specific policies from other states, one of which was Montana um, during their, their October uh, working group discussion. So um, you see here some specifics on how to make kind of this existing statute more presumptive and encourage its use. Um, modifying language from may file a motion to shall file a motion for DOC to do these at the midpoint review, requiring judges to grant a request for discharge unless they determine it's not in the best interest of the person on probation or would present a risk of danger to the victim of the offense. And then also, if someone is not ready to be discharged at their midpoint, making sure to set up additional opportunities um, for them to be able to um, kind of prove that they are successful and again, be recommended for discharge later in their sentence. And uh, again, this is what was adopted by the working group um, with comment, uh, just to, to be clear, the, represent, um, the Vermont Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence did state the importance of honoring the rights of victims, ensuring proper notification and communication uh, processes are incorporated into this policy if it's, when it's adopted. Um, into statute. So um, <laughs> this is kind of, so that, that's where the policy discussion of the working group went and what they're ultimately recommending to you all as the legislature um, for addressing the, these probation issues. Um, regardless of what of legislative or administrative policy changes, it's really important to remember that this um, these improvements to probation are part of a really large, a much larger picture within Vermont um, that justice reinvestment has been helping you all tackle and improving your community supervision um, system generally. So that's probation, parole, and furlough um, to reduce technical violations that result in prison revocation. And this really needs to be part of a holistic package of improving the effectiveness of how people are supervised in the community by community supervision officers through graduated sanctions, use of incentives, um, and other research-informed practices to promote positive behavior change. Also, it needs to be part of ensuring people receive the services they need um, uh, I, while in the community to address their criminogenic mental health and substance use needs. And of course, increasing community-based resources for people on supervision uh, with these mental health and substance use disorders are really, is really important if we want to help people be successful in the community and not come back into the prison system. Okay, with that, I get to uh, take a pause and catch my breath and pass the baton to David, um, who is going to talk uh, with you all about the mental health and substance use work that uh, we did with the working group this past fall. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk with you all again. Uh, as uh, with the things that Sarah was covering, some of you uh, will have heard of this previously, and so you'll be, you'll be hearing it again. Uh, but we're going to go through what we see and what we recommend and what the working group recommends uh, in terms of substance use and mental health needs among folks. So Sarah, if you're going, you'll be handling the slides, I believe, if you would move to the next slide. So the working group prioritized three areas of study looking at issues related to mental health and substance use, and they were outlined in Act 148. That includes determining whether the screening assessment uh, case planning and care coordination gaps existed, if any, uh, for folks with complex mental health and substance use issues that are in the criminal justice system, and to recommend improvements where needed. Secondly, to identify ways to increase uh, the Department of Correction and Community Provider Risk Assessment information sharing. Uh, there is risk assessment that's going on that's very good, but the sharing of that information to help inform plea agreement, sentencing, and revocation decisions. 
and th third, to identify new or existing tools to identify risk factors that can be targeted with treatment and services. Next slide, please. Additionally, Act 148 directed AHS, the Agency of Human Services, to work with us uh, to report current mental health and substance use assessments, case planning, and information sharing practices across AHS. Um, and so part of what we looked at uh, together with AHS was uh, what kind of information uh, do we need to make decisions? And so we took a collaborative cross-system approach to gathering the information. It was then used to inform the working group's tasks related to studying and making recommendations around mental health and substance use. And so uh, we looked at, uh, this included, of course, the Department of Correction, Department of Mental Health, Department of Health, uh, and, and ADAP, of course, under the Department of Health, uh, as part of the Department of Health and the Department for Children and Families. It also uh, included other stakeholders, uh, the parole board, for example, which is very important, the courts uh, who need mental health and substance use information to make critical decisions as the person does move through the various intercepts of the criminal justice system. Really, the, this kind of information is important literally from the moment that person hits the criminal justice system and then all the way through. Next slide, please. Now, the, uh, one of the upsides is that as we looked at assessment and screening processes, Vermont really does a very good job overall in terms of screening uh, and assessing for mental health needs and substance use needs. In terms of uh, folks who are detained, there's a substance use screener and a mental health screener. For those folks who are sentenced, there is the substance use screener, the mental health screener, as well as follow-up clinical assessment. The same is true for those folks that are on furlough or parole. And for those folks on probation, or meaning going directly to probation, there's a substance use screener, uh, there's follow-up clinical assessment as appropriate. There uh, has not been the use of a mental health screener. And uh, one of the things that we have pointed out is that that needs to be put in place. Having said that, um, Vermont is among the you know, top states, frankly, in terms of having these kinds of screeners in place at various intercepts. And so while there, uh, we have some suggestions for improvement here, I really do want to sort of uh, talk about the fact that what we're talking about is improving on something that has been developed rather nicely already. And, and that is a nice thing to be able to say and to be able to see. Next slide, please. Now, Vermont does have treatment case planning policies that are in place, but the reality is that folks are still inconsistently connected to community-based services and specifically community-based mental health and substance use services, which are the ones that I'm focusing on here. Uh, there's correct community correctional programming services. That's a different discussion, just to be clear. What we're really talking about here are the mental health and substance use treatment services. The importance of them is that because of the complexity of Vermont's criminal justice population, because Vermont has done a really a very good job of uh, weeding out, if you will, lower risk folks, what you are left with in terms of your population are the folks that are the most complex. And the complexity isn't simply that they are, quote, more criminal. They may or may not be. The complexity is that they have much higher rates of mental health and substance use needs. And so when you look at the success and failure of those individuals, the success and failure is directly impacted by their mental health and substance use needs, regardless of what criminal piece they may have, the effectiveness of treating that is um, impacted by whether or not the mental health and substance use needs are treated. If they are, then dealing with other high risk issues becomes very doable. If they're not, then it doesn't work. Uh, so to, to put, put it very simply, you can't focus on the cognitive correctional interventions in a way that is effective if there are things that are getting in the way for, for the individual processing that stuff. And the things that get in the way are the mental health and substance use needs. Now, when we talk about uh, the case planning policies, 
There are ongoing challenges to sharing relevant mental health and substance, substance use information um, and coordinating the care between the Department of Correction and community-based providers, which can, not surprisingly, negatively impact the overall case planning and the subsequent treat, treatment and programming referrals. Now, in reality, some DOC supervisions have built very strong relationships with local offices. They leverage these connections to help clients connect with the available services. I've seen this, they do a wonderful job, but the fact is it's not consistent across the state. And so it results in geographic variations in care coordination. For folks who are, uh, have co-occurring disorders and are receiving medication-assisted treatment for the substance use uh, disorder, there's often a lack of coordination between the mental health treatment uh, and, the, and the substance use treatment across providers and supervision agents. And the assessment and screening results are not consistently shared between DOC, meaning the healthcare contractor, the facility caseworkers, and the supervision officers, and the community-based providers in order to effectively inform case management and care coordination. And so while there's a lot of good information that is gathered and being developed and being used in siloed ways, it is not being used uh, as well as it can be across within the systems, across different parts of a system and across the systems that need to be responding to these individuals. Next slide, please. Um, the mental health and substance use information sharing between the Department of Correction, community-based providers, and the parole board remains inconsistent. Current information sharing between supervision officers and community providers is generally based on relationships, as I mentioned before, rather than on established processes or policies, and therefore it varies widely across the state. AHS does not yet have an umbrella information sharing policy that governs how its departments share information to support people with mental health and substance use needs in the criminal justice system who are served by more than one department. I mean, the beauty of what you have in Vermont is that you have all of your key departments under one parent agency. What you don't yet have are those departments working in sync. I also need to say that they are clearly focusing on this issue. They have started meeting. They have started uh, interagency meetings. They are working on an information sharing policy. So I want to give a lot of credit to AHS for beginning that process as this information became uh, available and obvious that these problems existed. Uh, they, they are not sitting back and waiting. They are beginning to dive in to look at what can be done. For folks that are sentenced straight to probation, uh, there's less mental health and substance use assessment and screening information available to inform the supervision conditions than there is for people transitioning to furlough or parole. Or in other words, too often what happens is the court makes stipulations without the necessary information to inform those stipulations. What that results in uh, are really two different things. One is people getting ordered to programming that they don't need. And secondarily, and, and arguably even more problematic, people not getting ordered to programming that they do need in order to succeed. So what happens is they have to fail once before that programming gets in, they get involved in that programming. We're suggesting that th that needs to be looked at right up front and the determinations need to be made uh, at that beginning stage that the courts need to have the relevant information to make those decisions. Next slide, please. Uh, Vermont does face several challenges uh, to improving information sharing. Uh, there are real and perceived limitations related to federal privacy laws and regulations, including HIPAA and 42 CFR Part 2, which is the Substance Use uh, Act. Uh, I say real and perceived because there are, in fact, um, very specific rules that have to be followed. What we find typically and what we found in Vermont is that there were lots of perceived uh, barriers that actually HIPAA and 42 CFR don't say, um, but that people believed that it said. And so they were saying, we can't do this or this or this. Again, AHS and their attorneys are examining this very closely and really uh, separating out what the real rules are, if you will, versus what the perceived are so that we can get those barriers out of the way. There's inconsistent knowledge among DOC staff, parole board, and other criminal justice stakeholders regarding evidence-based practices for serving people with substance use and mental health needs. 
We're working with DOC and the parole board to bring in uh, a variety of forms of training that will be cross-discipline uh, training and both state and community providers uh, training for both groups of individuals. Uh, because of, uh, and, and the reason for that has to do with the inconsistent knowledge among the community-based providers uh, in terms of serving folks in the criminal justice system. Some of them have a lot of knowledge about that. Some of them don't and have just uh, mistaken ideas basically about who the clientele are and mistaken ideas as to whether or not they are actually serving these clients. <clears throat> what we know from around the country is that in reality, a very large number of people that are served by mental health and substance use programs, even if they are not involved with the criminal justice system at the moment, have been at some point. And so it's less an issue of differences among who the clients are and more an issue of whether or not you get that client when they have criminal justice involvement or when they are not involved in the criminal justice system. There is, of course, a lack of resources to address some of the geographic disparities in mental health and substance use disorder uh, services. And so in some cases, the problem becomes knowledge that, that they need to develop. And in some cases, it just doesn't exist. It's not in that area. It's not an issue of knowledge. It's an issue of lack of resources. And there's, tends, there has tended to be a lack of resources to increase information sharing to inform the supervision conditions pre-sentencing. Going back to what I said earlier, having that information for the court in a timely manner as they make their decisions uh, about what the conditions should be for individuals who are going straight to probation. Next slide, please. So in January, the working group adopted four recommendations related to mental health and substance use disorder for inclusion in the reports of the legislator. Uh, option one, uh, we suggested could be done administratively, uh, which is recommending that AHS convene representatives from each relevant department in the agency to develop and implement changes to policy and procedure that may address, uh, in order to address barriers to information sharing and care coordination in order to support folks in the criminal justice system with mental health and substance use needs. It was recommended that the group could collaboratively modify agency policy and procedure to adjust provider contracts, to supply structure to the information sharing practices. In other words, this is how it should be, and it's gonna be the same no matter where we are in the state. To standardize the AHS mental health and substance use needs information sharing between the Department of Correction and community providers, including the sharing of relevant assessment results. To adopt a collaborative, coordinated case planning model, there shouldn't be 10 case plans for an individual. If somebody is in the criminal justice system, there should be a master case plan that is then coordinated among all of the various services that, uh, that people need to be receiving. Uh, and so what you see too often is are the development of uh, sort of seven different plans, and, and those plans do sometimes have crossover, but very often the different system actors are not aware of what are in the other plans. So you have both duplication of services, and in some cases you have a clash of services because there isn't a coordinated plan in terms of how to give whatever that individual may need uh, the appropriate services in the appropriate ways. Uh, and then lastly, to identify opportunities for mental health, substance use, and criminal justice cross-training. And again, back to the issue of if you're going to coordinate something, everybody needs to understand not only their role, but the other system actor's role and what is going on. This option was adopted by the working group. There was one objection. The Defender General uh, registered an objection because the Prisoner's Rights Office was not being represented in the group. Uh, and there was discussion back and forth. This is an internal AHS group, uh, but there was discussion back and forth and the Defender General did object based on uh, believing that they should be uh, represented in these group meetings uh, for the purposes of developing and implementing policy and practice changes. Next slide, please. The um, second option uh, was recommending that DOC use a validated mental health screening tool for people sentenced directly to misdemeanor probation. You'll remember from the earlier slide, that was the one box that was uh, not checked, if you will, in terms of assessment. It was adopted by the working group without objection. The third one, legislative, recommend that the legislature require DOC to develop a brief report that will be provided to judges before sentencing to inform condition setting for all felony cases. The report should include risk and need assessment results, the mental health and substance use disorder screen, uh, screening results, and the criminal history. 
Uh, this option was also adopted by the working group uh, with comment. DOC stated that uh, the pre-sentencing assessment process would be most effectively imp uh, excuse me, <laughs> implemented through demonstration sites prior to a state right, statewide rollout. They, they wanted to try this in two or three places, work the bugs out, if you will, uh, before doing this at a statewide, uh, on a statewide level. Next slide, please. And then the fourth option, we labeled it as strategic um, because of the we're sort of the early stages of it. But the recommendation was that DOC explore hiring licensed clinicians to be placed in local supervision offices in order to administer the mental health and substance use screenings and assessments, as well as to liaison with community-based treatment providers. It also may be uh, that in some cases, the local agencies have enough staff that they would want to embed or place somebody into the office. So there's different options. Uh, to be clear, this is not about uh, these individuals providing treatment to supervisees. That is the work of the clinicians in the field. It is to help supervision officers have a better handle on who their clients are. It's to improve the relationship between supervision offices and community providers. And it's to make sure that treatment needs of individuals don't fall through the cracks. And this option was adopted by the working group without objection. Next slide. And back to Sarah. Sorry, a little second to unmute there. Thank you so much, David. Um, and really for this next section, I think you'll probably be hearing from both David and I, but uh, in addition to, so uh, what we've just reviewed are really the policy options recommended to the legislature. However, um, and these were the things that were actually adopted by the working group. However, there are two additional conversations that the working group had, although they did not adopt anything or vote on anything, that we wanted to make sure were kind of documented in this report. And uh, the first one of these are opportunities for reinvestment. So we actually, CSU Justice Center staff actually heard from the working, from a variety of working group members early on in the process when we were kind of, um, when we were laying out the schedule for what would be covered in the, in the four meetings. Um, that folks wanted to return to the conversation on budgetary investments into uh, into justice reinvestment policies that had been started prior to the pandemic. And then, you know, <laughs> the pandemic happens and life gets all out of sorts. And, um, and, uh, and I think, you know, was mostly felt like a, a little unfinished. Um, and so with this in mind, in the November working group meeting, and then again for discussion in the January working group meeting, CSG Justice Center staff presented uh, to the working group options for fiscal investments to bolster justice reinvestment policies, um, particularly policies in Act 148, but generally um, just the kind of all of to, to address the challenges found, challenges found through the justice reinvestment process. So, you know, just to, just to be clear, and you'll see this written here, these were not adopted by working group members, but they were just discussed by working group members. And these are ultimately, you know, recommendations that come out of CSG's thinking. Um, so first off, really helpful to acknowledge that in the FY 2021 budget that was passed this fall, um, kind of while the working group was still in the beginning of their meetings, um, there was reinvest what we call reinvestment into Act 148 policies, um, which was to uh, invest any out-of-state bed savings um, from DOC into domestic violence intervention programs. Um, so we want to acknowledge that that happens that or that investing out-of-state bed savings is in the the most recent budget that was passed. However. In addition, we made uh, a number of recommendations um, for the upcoming budget cycle of ways we can could strengthen these policies and address needs. Um, and so that is $200,000 to maintain investments in domestic violence intervention programming. So it's not really enough to do a one-time investment in domestic violence intervention programming. This does mean to, this is an ongoing need. And this is where I'll actually kick it to David to talk about this specifically, because you'll hear it's uh, David's passion point for Vermont. Some of you may have heard me uh, testify in, in when we were doing phase one around this issue. I would like to encourage the legislature to 
really closely focus on domestic violence intervention programming. With the best of intentions, Vermont has made some problematic decisions in responding to domestic violence and uh, programs uh, were defunded. Uh, and the, intent, the reason that happened was a concern for wanting evidence-based programming and, and that's valid. The mistake was you don't take money away and then tell people to figure out how to do evidence-based programming. You say to folks, over the course of the next 18 to 36 months, there needs to be a series of evidence-based programs developed. We realize that in order to do this, it requires certain kinds of uh, studies, certain kinds of programming, and certain kinds of resources. And so when you look at the issue of violent crime in Vermont, what you see is that a great amount of it is related to domestic violence and intimate partner violence. And yet it is right now uh, probably the weakest response set that you have in place. And so I want to encourage the legislature to really focus on uh, working with the, uh, the council and with the other relevant individuals to make sure that one, funding is available, that two, there is a clear plan about the development of several levels of program response and that it be done in a way where um, that it be done in a way where it's very clear that there is a funding pot and that that funding pot is not to be interfered with because if you want to lower violence in Vermont your biggest bang for the buck will be to effectively focus on the issue or the problem of domestic violence and the interrelationship between domestic violence and people with mental health issues and substance use issues is overwhelming. We have a tendency to carve out people by offense as opposed to look at the complexity of the issue. And when you look at people who commit domestic violence, they are not a uniform group there are a series of different things that cause the behavior. In some cases, they are criminal. In some cases, it has to do with beliefs they may have about what being male is. And in very many cases, based on current research, there is also an intersection of significant mental health, trauma, and substance use needs. And so uh, I would argue that one, funding appropriate mental health and substance use services, and two, really looking at the expansion of domestic violence assessment and programming will go a long way to really impacting the, the problem of violence in Vermont. Uh, and Sarah, I'm done now. <laughs> uh, thanks so much, David. Um, and I, I have a feeling you might also have similar things to say for the next item, which is 400,000 to target gaps in mental health and substance use for communities uh, in uh, use community services for people on supervision. So you've already heard David talk about the real needs there um, uh, in his previous section. Uh, this money would go to AHS to be distributed to the Department of Health, uh, ADAP, and the Department of Mental Health for them to really assess what uh, programs need to be bolstered and where the gaps are and, um, and fill those gaps uh, for people in the criminal justice system. Sarah, I'm just mm -hmm. wondering, uh, looking at the time, can you be finished by 11.15 to allow us half an hour for questions? Definitely, and hopefully okay. we only have a couple more slides to go, so hopefully before that. Okay. Good enough. Thank you. Um, we also have a recommendation for $300,000 to strengthen transitional housing options and advocacy. I have a feeling that it's no surprise uh, to folks um, on uh, in this Zoom that you know uh, housing uh, in Vermont is generally a problem. You all have housing uh, stock issues and very, very low vacancy rates, and it's even more so for people transitioning from the criminal justice system into the community. And there's a lot of churn going on there. 
uh, where people are having problems finding housing in transitional housing programs, et cetera, and then coming back into incarceration. Um, so this $300,000, would uh, provide training to increase uh, the housing providers' adherence to best practices for people uh, in the criminal justice system and also with mental health and substance use disorders, um, create uh, to help increase housing stock um, and, and landlords who are uh, interested and willing to rent their um, their apartments to uh, folks with criminal histories by creating a a funding pool to decrease the risk for, for those landlords. And then also to uh, set up additional assessment tools um, that folks can use within the criminal justice system to better identify what housing needs are out there so that in the future, you all can have a better understanding of what your needs and challenges are and then uh, target kind of pinpoint solutions to target those, those challenges. Now, th those were the uh, funding items that we were able to kind of put, uh, you know, um, put actual number amounts to. There are additional things that cost money uh, that we do think that uh, Vermont should consider, although we weren't able to pinpoint um, specific numbers on them. So another thing that's important is to strengthen, uh, Vermont needs to strengthen its data uh, kind of collection and analysis capacity generally. But, um, but also to increase funding to, um, uh, to support data-driven decision-making for DOC's data system specifically, uh, so, that that, that, so that the um, data coming out of DOC is uh, better uh, able to be analyzed and shared. Um, and then also, uh, we did note um, the racial disparities in, crim uh, in the criminal justice and the Criminal and Juvenile Justice uh, Advisory Panel, RDAP, um, did a, a report and did a whole bunch of work coming out of uh, Section 19 of Act 148. They were directed to, to study and make recommendations um, and just that to support that their recommendation to create a three-person body charged with definition, collection, and analysis of data pertaining to racial disparities across the juvenile and adult criminal justice systems. It's very important uh, that Vermont have a better understanding of what is going on related to racial disparities in the system and, and really put additional data collection and analysis capacity towards it. Um, what's really... Uh, What's really wonderful to note, I should say, since this report was submitted on January 15th, the governor has released uh, his budget and $900,000 is in the budget related to these funding recommendations um, for justice reinvestment policies. So uh, the, the, um, the domestic violence intervention programming, the mental health and substance use funding and the housing funding is currently in the governor's budget. We really appreciate, um, you know, the governor staff is rep uh, is uh, represented on the working group, and really appreciate uh, the thought that they put into that um, to kind of push some of these funding recommendations along. When we first started this, and people asked us, well, you know, what money would you put towards this um, in the beginning of the fall and in, uh, in in August and September? We're kind of like, oh man, it's a pandemic. <laughs> um, you know, like the budget situation, state budgets across the country are extremely tough right now. Um, we weren't really expecting anything, understanding that there's just a lot of competing priorities and a lot of really tough decisions being made around budgets. Um, so uh, it was really impressive to see folks taking this seriously despite tough budget situations that, th that these were policies that, um, that Vermonters wanted to support. And we really appreciate that. Uh, Chair Emmons. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, sorry, I thought I saw your hand go up. Uh, Sarah, is, is that uh, the extent of it? So there's just a really quick wrap up section and I will do this. Uh, yeah, I will do this in less than five minutes, I promise. Um, just to think through the working group also is thinking through their own sustainability and what, you know, what they're going to look like moving forward. So just to flag that for folks. Um, so the working group discussed uh, ways um, 
for the, their own work to continue um, the justice reinvestment efforts in 2021 and beyond. And, and what I really want to flag for folks within this section is right now, CSG Justice Center is providing kind of staffing and facilitation support for the working group. But we're actually only funded to be in Vermont through the end of 2021. So um, we're not going to be around when this the second working group report uh, needs to be submitted in January 15, 2022. Um, in addition, our work is supposed to kind of gradually ramp down as the year progresses. Um, so we really wanted the working group to consider their own sustainability when we're not able to facilitate the process and for folks in Vermont to think through if the working group is process is feeling successful and useful to folks in Vermont, you know, what should they be working on and what should that look like moving forward? So the three kind of, uh, the three things that we discussed with the working group is, you know, is there in-state staff to, to support ongoing justice reinvestment to working group meetings in 2021 and beyond um, so once CSG is no longer able to support the process? Um, you know, what should the regular meeting schedule be moving forward? And they did set a meeting schedule for the, um, for the last six months of 2021, they'll be meeting four times. Um, that was accomplished uh, during the meeting. And then also is the working group currently kind of, are the duties of the working group currently aligned with what the working group wants to be working on? So they need to oversee implementation. They also have a few additional duties that they didn't tackle. They didn't have time to tackle before their report. Um, these are to study the efficacy of presumptive probation sentencing to evaluate the policy of parole eligibility for older incarcerated adults. Um, and then of course they have this other report due. So are these the things they wanna be tackling moving forward and how do they wanna sustain the working group process when CSG kind of has to take a step back? So just to kind of um, make sure that everyone's aware that that's going on. And those are also conversations the working group had around their own sustainability. And then I believe we just have the last this should be the last page of the report, is just um, the four working group meetings that were scheduled during the last meeting um, throughout 2021. Uh, and, uh, if, um, and there's also here a link to where all of the materials are on the Supreme Court's website, um, and Merrick being the kind of staff, the in, the in, in Vermont staff support for, for the working group meetings. So now I am complete. <laughs> we've, we've worked through. We've worked through all of it. Well, thank you so much, Sarah and David. Um, and thank you to CSG for huge amounts of work that we are indebted to you going forward. Um, questions, we have, we have a little over a half an hour. Um, and I guess I'll respond to um, blue hands. But first, I wanted to ask the two chairs whether they have any questions. Uh, Chair Emmons, Chair Grad. I do not. I would just encourage uh, members of all the committees to ask some questions. Okay. Um, so blue hands, I don't currently see any. Uh, Representative uh, Campbell has his blue hand up. Yeah. And then Representative Coffey has her hand up. I don't know if you okay. can see that, Phil. I, and then oh, Representative yes. Colburn has now her I hand do. up. Okay. Uh, uh, Representative Emmons, would you like to, um, cause my, my, uh, my eyesight is not as. And maybe I can see it better. So we'll go with Representative Campbell, then Representative Coffey, and then Representative Colburn. Great. All right. Thank you. Um, I am wondering whether the group discussed, um, restorative justice as, as part of the system as well. I don't know who to address that to. Maybe, uh, maybe Sarah, maybe. David? Yeah, sure. Uh, we did not discuss that specifically um, as part of the system uh, in that they were kind of tackling a very uh, long but discrete list of uh, duties assigned to them, and that wasn't one of them. I think this is kind of part of the conversation moving forward about what the working group should be um, in that they kind of had three months to tackle a whole bunch of statutory duties, and it went very, very quickly. But I, I think there is kind of this um, moment to think through moving forward, you know, what should the duties of the working group be and, and what should the conversations they be having as it continues into 2021 as it is in statute and if, if 
uh, Vermont wants is finding it, the process valuable and wants it to, to continue it beyond um, January 15th, 2022. What I can tell you is that in uh, some of our discussions with the agencies and particularly both DOC and, and Department of Mental Health, that that, uh, that issue and the expansion of restorative justice work that's already occurring in Vermont uh, has been discussed and there is uh, certainly significant uh, uh, interest in looking at that further and expanding that. And so uh, while it was not something that the working group was able to focus on specifically, I'm pleased to say that there are indeed uh, significant folks, uh, key folks in both those areas, both those agencies, excuse me, uh, that are discussing it and are, are, are looking at how to really uh, further expand and improve what it is that Vermont is already doing. Thank you. Uh, Representative Coffey and then Representative Colburn. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Sarah and David. This is, I, I just so appreciate the deep dive that the Council on State Governments and the Justice Center take. The, your partnership with us has been amazing. And this report is so helpful. Um, so I have a specific question. You know, when we worked on um, Act 148, um, the, the concept of investment uh, is about reducing the number of people who are in our facilities and um, moving them out of our facilities and into the community as a way of better supporting and having better outcomes, but also to have a positive um, fiscal impact and to invest those dollars saved in community supports. So I'm about to ask kind of a loaded question. Um, there's, there's um, some legislation in the work around um, earned good time. And I know when we earn good time is a really important part of the justice reinvestment work. And I think there was a fiscal, a financial calculation made based on earned good time. And we spent a lot of time looking at the number of days um, uh, served, you know, a number of days that could be earned per month. If we were to change um, some of the, the, peop the number of people or the kinds of uh, people based on their crimes um, and their accessibility to earn good time, what would the fiscal impact be? Do you have that? I think, I don't know if David was the one who did those calculations. Uh, no, I, I was not the one. Our research okay. division did that. Oh, sorry. Um, sorry to put you on the spot there, but I'm just wondering. Okay. Yeah, if you, if you have a sense of that, because it sounds like we're also looking at taking a similar approach to folks who are on uh, community supervision um, as a way of, of uh, improving um, our system. So I'd love to hear your thoughts. It's a complicated question and answer. Um, I'll let Sarah uh, clean up after I uh, give some thoughts. But um, the, the answer is it depends on what you end up changing. Is there, uh, is there any room to make any change without impacting savings? There's some room depend because we are always conservative in our estimates, but it depends on what that ends up being, right? If it affects an extremely large number of individuals or you go very broad in terms of the types of crimes that it affects, then at a certain point, yes, it's going to impact that. Um, but without knowing more specifically where that sort of ending, it's hard for us to do any kind of comparison between, oh, if they drop these three things or these five things, you know, we'd have to then go back and say, well, what, when we did our original assessment or, or the original data um, work, what did we include? What did we exclude at that point? We try to be conservative when we give savings numbers. So there's always a little bit of wiggle room. But if, if suddenly massive changes were made and, and a very large amount of the population suddenly became uh, ineligible, yes, it would certainly um, impact your savings. There, there's no question about that. But, but I don't know where that cutoff is without other information and the ability to compare that with the original calculations. Sure. I mean, I don't think that has been made. So I, I appreciate the, the answer. If we, is it the kind of thing that if we if we hone in on that, that we could get your your technical assistance in helping us do that? Thank you. Yeah, we can. I mean, uh, we've been following F-18, right, as it, as it works through your process. Um, 
And right now, my understanding is that it's a pretty limited set of carve outs. Um, so I do off the cuff, um, which means <laughs> I'm a little reluctant to say this, but um, I don't have those numbers at my fingertips, but with my current understanding of S18, I don't, I, although I think it will have an impact, I don't think it will be a very large impact because right now it, it seems like a pretty limited carve out, but we can look at that specifically and rerun our numbers based on, um, based on what that looks like now. And, and we'd be happy to provide that information. Um, I think I think that generally based on my understanding is that there would be an impact, but as it's written right now, it's that the carve out hasn't, is not huge. It hasn't been expanded to, you know, all listed crimes or the big 12 or, you know, um, that you, you all are probably in, in decent shape there, but I'm happy to do it. Uh, I, we can look at the most current draft of S18 or if someone wants to send us, you know, what they, another set of carve outs that they think might happen, we can model that. Uh, Representative Colburn. Thank you so much. Um, and thanks so much for your presentation this morning. It's been really informative. Uh, I have a, just a couple of questions and a comment. And since I don't see another hand up, I'm going to assume it's okay to just kind of dump them in one go, unless I hear otherwise um, from the chair. But both really of my questions relate to some of the data you shared. And the first is about the probation revocation charts that we saw. And I'm just wondering how much variation there is in the underlying data there. Like how, I think the question I'm trying to ask is how typical is that average? You know, are we mostly seeing a lot of data that looks like that average? Or are we seeing all stuff that's all over the place that kind of creates that average? So I would have to go back to the original data. And really, um, you all are making with that Angie Gunter, who is, we have a research staff on our team. <laughs> she's really wonderful. <laughs> Wish, wishing that uh, that she was on here to answer your questions directly because she would be able to answer it, you know, off the top of her head. Um, uh, my sense is that the average was, you know, the typical. Um, I know that, you know, using average versus median and, and there are reasons, but um, I don't think that the average was being pulled up or down by outliers, which I think is what you're asking. But I would have to go back and verify that and, and I can do that. Um, yeah, I think I think that would be helpful. But thank you for your that response. And then my other question is about the um, the substance use disorder and mental health screening that happens. Um, and I apologize if I cut out again. I'm getting a little bit of internet instability messaging here. But I'm curious about how. So we know that the practices are in place, and I'm curious about how readily the data associated with those screening practices, how, how available you found that data to be, to be able to sort of really understand what percentage of a population in different supervision categories kind of correlated to those, those kinds of assessments. Um, when, when you say readily available, uh, readily available to whom? Well, <laughs> I mean, I guess the first question would be you because I know accessing data at times was, um, has been an issue sometimes in your work, just kind of moving through all the players and finding the data. But I guess also to those of us as poly policymakers or even the public who want more transparency on understanding how those issues intersect with um, the work that happens in our corrections department. So the the, the complication in answering that is that it depends on what intercept you're talking about. Uh, and, and by intercept, I mean what section or segment of the criminal justice system we're discussing. And so if we're talking about within the Department of Correction in terms of the assessment data, that assessment data is available internally, anything that has happened within the department. And it's also available to all of the supervision office, excuse me, officers. Um, and so that data is there, it's a system they share. Where it gets, um, 
where, where the sharing problems become more problematic are when we look at information sharing between different agencies, say, for example, the Department of Correction and the Department of Mental Health or the Department of Health, or when you're looking at information sharing between any of those departments and, say, a community agency or the community agency back. That's where the focus and the work on the policy shifts are really happening and need to happen because all of these folks play a major role. If we're talking about the screening that happens initially for those people who go directly to probation, that information when it's done, and right now it's substance use screening, not mental health screening, although they're going to put that in place, that information um, is always available to the court my review of that was that whether or not, how do I want to say this? Um, there's, there's availability and there's whether you use it. And so uh, what you have are variations in whether or not the bench says, I want this information before I make this decision. And in some cases, the bench does. In other cases, they don't. Um, and so what you have are sort of variations based on whoever happens to be sitting on the bench, as opposed to uh, a, a, a systemic policy that says, these are the things that need to be looked at. These are the things that need to go to the bench and uh, before the bench makes a decision. And ultimately the bench makes the final decision of what they're gonna use, don't misunderstand me. But, but there should be a greater consistency of that information getting to the appropriate judge, you know, to do the judges basically, right? Um, and, and making sure that they have that available as they're trying to make their determinations. And, uh, and, and arguably uh, some additional uh, discussion, you know, judicial education kinds of things that happen every year as to why and how that plays into making the best decisions uh, for that individual. So it's, it, there, you have, so again, to boil that down, within systems, you've got a lot of good information sharing. Between agencies, it gets a bit problematic. Once you get between the state system and the community system, uh, that's where it really falls down and where the big focus in terms of change uh, has to happen over the coming year. Is that helpful? It is. And I just had one, um, maybe more of a comment than a question. Um, that I was really happy and excited to see the recommendation about cross-training for um, people who are supervising folks in mental health um, crisis issues and in substance use disorder. And I'm just hopeful that that recommendation extends not just to folks who are supervising people in community settings, but also in incarcerative settings, just thinking about our medication assisted treatment program in Corrections, I know that um, sort of at times worker, you know, buy-in or just information about why that program exists has has been a question, and so hopefully it's a whole, that would be a holistic recommendation. Uh, very, very much so. Uh, it it you know Vermont uh, reminds me of the Chicago jail problem. Um, Vermont's Department of Correction, for all intents and purposes, is the largest mental health provider in the state. Um, and they have the largest number of mental health clients. Uh, and and I'm, uh, I should say mental health and substance use clients, just to be clear. Uh, and and the, uh, uh, the failure rate that you see in Vermont is not because of the high criminogenic risk of your people, although that exists, don't misunderstand me for some of them. It is because of those, uh, and I use the word ancillary as in supporting uh, issues of mental health and substance use. And so uh, there, it does require a change in the cultural thinking of systems uh, because who it is that those systems are dealing with are not the people that they were dealing with 20 years ago. Um, I have one question, David. This is kind of a follow up in terms of the sharing of the information. So is it fair to say that the lack of sharing is more with folks not being used to sharing it, not having the protocols in place, um, maybe not wanting to share it? 
um, versus um, IT issues? Oh, you have IT issues. Um, I, 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 so let, let me just start with that one. Um, you have IT issues. Uh, you have major IT issues. And uh, those IT issues are uh, certainly cause problems. Um, and those IT issues would require a significant amount of investment to fix. Uh, you have too many disparate systems. You have systems that are not well-developed in some cases, uh, meaning technically uh, well-developed. So, so that is real. Um, and that is a technological problem. The other side of that is that you also have what some kind, sometimes called an adaptive problem or a cultural problem, which is the belief, uh, what you see is uh, too often a belief that uh, the system that you're working in is the one that's supposed to fix it all. And so uh, you have the agency pretty, you know, and I'm a clinician by training and so I've been guilty of this, right? I've got the right view on the world. And so that's the only view that, that exists. Well, that's not true. Um, and so the information sharing, uh, there are different reasons for that. Some folks don't share information because they're afraid that they'll be judged for what they have or haven't done. Some folks don't share information because they believe genuinely that legally uh, client, uh, patient or client privacy must take uh, uh, must be over everything else, and and there's no way around that. Which I don't in any I don't mean to doubt, but when you're talking about a criminal justice client, there are some limitations as a result of that. Um, some people genuinely are worried about the way the laws have been passed because, in fairness, both HIPAA and CFR have not been the clearest uh, in terms of how they were developed, though they're, they keep fixing them and keep improving them. Um, and so it, it's, it's those different. Oh, and then the last one is um, some folks fear that the people they're sharing the information with will use it to be harmful to the client. You particularly get that from uh, uh, mental health and substance use agencies, particularly mental health agencies, when they're dealing with criminal justice supervisors, et cetera. So you have a series of different issues uh, that are, I would argue, are all based on the fact that you don't have the appropriate cross-system training and knowledge and understanding of what each group's role is and how each group actually plays a significant role in the success of that client. And, and so, again, one of the big things that we, one of the several big things that we've been pushing in terms of our ability to provide support is bringing folks in to do that cross-system training to get people playing, uh, what, singing from the same hymn book, uh, you know, whatever phrase you want to use, uh, that everybody's goal should be twofold. Goal one is community safety. Goal two, goal two is the success of that client. They are not mutually exclusive. Um, the community is safe when the client succeeds. Uh, and so all those folks have to do that. The best information sharing, uh, how do I want to put this? Uh, if I had an unlimited purse, You'd have, a, you'd have a system that was consistent across all of your agencies with the appropriate firewall so that people could only access what they should access. And you wouldn't have what is essentially right now a system where it's dependent on the goodwill of too many individuals to do the extra work to make sure it gets to the other folks. Um, and I realize that's an expensive process and you're not going to be able to do that right away. But I would argue that one of the long-term technological fixes that Vermont should look at is a, and I would argue that it needs to be looked at by a group of uh, interdisciplinary individuals, not just your IT group, not just your your um, user group, but but by an interdisciplinary group of what is working, what isn't, and what do we need to have in place to get the end result we want. Too often, what I see are people keep putting Band-Aids on an existing system when something new comes in, but they still don't get the end result they want. So what's the end result you want? And what do we need to build to do that? What do we already have in place? What do we need to, or, or do we need to dump it and change it? Um, and I don't know what the answer to that is for Vermont. I just know that what you have now um, does make it a bit more difficult for the information sharing to happen in a, in a, a uniform manner. David, Sorry, um, thank you. I, I just want to remind folks if they can mute if they're not uh, speaking. We're getting some interference. Um, uh, go ahead, Chair Emmons. 
I don't see any more questions. Oh, I, I do. Uh, okay. uh, oh, I, yeah. I had Sorry. Representative Rachelson. Yep. Sorry. Thank you. Um, so my question is this, when, we, when you were talking about um, making sure that there's funding for um, evidence-based programs, I very much appreciated that. I'm wondering if you, when, when you were looking at domestic violence, for example, were you looking sort of within the framework of a correctional system, um, well, let me phrase it this way. Are you're making the assumption that things should stay um, within the system that they're in pretty much rather than um, possibly saying maybe for a mental health related crime, why is that person there in the first place and how can we get certain crimes out of the system or, or sort of stepping back when I've talked to people from other states and I've seen the college degrees that people have gotten or the treatment people have gotten over longer time periods, it's so different than Vermont. And I guess I'm just wondering what, what parameters or lenses you were looking through in making the recommendations. Um, I wanna make sure I understand the question. Are you asking whether or not the response to domestic violence should be a criminal justice response? Um, I mean, that one popped into my first, but not, I mean, I remember reading a couple of years ago, a study related to incarceration um, and what that did in terms of recidivism mm -hmm. versus other types of programs. Um, I wasn't prepared to say if I was thinking that shouldn't be a crime, which is why I jumped to the mental health okay. related diagnosis yet or addiction. So um, domestic violence abusers are not a homogenous group. Uh, there are a percentage of them that, um, so, so first of all, we underestimate and under respond to domestic violence as a country. Uh, and when we look at the correlation between domestic violence and mass shootings and domestic violence and other kinds of violence, it's overwhelming. So it is indeed a criminal justice issue per se. Having said that, the fact that something fits into a certain system doesn't mean that that system has the only set of responses that will make a difference. Um, and separating the issue of incarceration versus community, the, the issue, so, so, <laughs> this, uh, this isn't a very subtle way of saying, some domestic violence abusers are just stupid. And, and the simple fact that they are exposed stops their behavior. Some of them have some extremely uh, societally inculcated issues about males versus females in terms of traditional patriarchal thinking, and they're a lot more resistive. And then there's a group, the top 25 or 30 percent of the group, who are um, very, very big criminal thinkers, meaning on top of everything else, they, they you know, Monday they rob the convenience store, Tuesday they beat up a little old lady, Wednesday they, they domestic violence. So what happened is that we created a one-size-fits-all response that effectively responds to that lowest group of people. And we don't effectively respond to the middle and upper group. And the middle and upper group are where you have those interactions of mental health, substance use, and criminogenic thinking. And right. so it is a multi-systemic, and they need to be held accountable, that's not my point, but right. it is a multi-systemic response in terms of being able to move them forward and to change the behavior. So David, can I ask you a follow-up? Um, I used to work with um, women who had addiction issues and were pregnant or parents. And one of our collaborating partners was an OBGYN mm -hmm. and she wanted the kids to, she wanted to make sure they were getting prenatal care. So she really did not want to emphasize the illegality part because she didn't want to scare people away from getting treatment. So I'm wondering about those kinds of intersections of um, knowing the help will go far, but um, somebody might get caught up in the wrong system in the meantime and be too afraid to engage. Um, I don't have an easy answer for that. And the, and the reason I don't have an easy answer for that is that you can't parse out the variations in those individuals until 
they come to light and until you've been able to assess them. And there are some people that a very light touch in terms of the criminal justice system is all you need for them to move forward. And there are others where you very much need um, a, a fairly tight hand, if you will, um, to, to um, manage them, if you will, or contain them for, and I don't mean necessarily in a prison, but contain them uh, for a period of time until certain things sink in. I think the, the issue becomes less whether or not for me, the issue becomes less for what less whether or not you you have the criminal justice piece, which I don't think you can get rid of. It becomes how you're approaching them. And one of the one of the failures that we've had in approaching certain types of violent crime, domestic violence, sexual violence, some other things, is that we've made assumptions that somehow they are fundamentally built differently than other people. And uh, in fact, what we now know is that while there may be some quote special needs in terms of their issues, that the overwhelming amounts of things that we know work with others will work with them as well. Uh, I, I would not, I would not, however, to be honest, I would not say that we. How do I want to say this? That they do need to be in the system, though, in some way, where they're held accountable but we need to not confuse accountability with the assumption that people can't change. If Same thing with addiction, you would say? Because okay. that's the- Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Representative Donnelly. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm really excited that you all are looking at ways to enhance collaboration between the world of mental health and, and probation and parole. And I guess one of the questions that comes up for me, one of the obstacles that often comes up in terms of more integrated um, operations with mental health is um, funding uh, streams and that there's often sort of competing funding streams and that, you know, can we bill for this essentially? Um, and if what we're talking about is a lot of more sort of case management type services and being able to show up at meetings and things like this, I'm just curious if in your work um, you've looked at whether there's funding within the DAs that's currently available for the kind of collaborative efforts that you guys are talking about or whether this would require creative funding streams in order to um, incentivize people to be able to show up at the table for these kind of efforts? Um, the, the short answer is yes um, to both of those things. Uh, there, I think there are currently, there is currently some ability to do that. I know, for example, some community agencies have already said that they want to do this and believe they can do it within their current structure. Other agencies cannot. One of the things that we were recommending in terms of the money that would go for mental health and substance use services uh, that's in the governor's budget is that it go to AHS so that it could target the delivery of those dollars to meet the different kinds of needs. And so for, for some places it might have to do with the dollars would be helpful in order to have some of these meetings. In other cases, the dollars might be helpful because they can't provide service B, but now they can provide service B because they've got those dollars. And that's not to suggest that the 400 will answer all those problems, but it will get that started so that you the wheels start turning in terms of that process. Uh, and so, and, and again, like everything else in Vermont or any other state, part of that ability of doing things with current funding depends on where you are in the state and, and what the um, solidity of your particular agency is uh, or size of your agency is and different funding streams. And Representative Taylor. Yes, um, I gather that in 2015 or so, the Vermont State Auditor looked into or did an investigation on transitional housing programs in Vermont. I'm wondering whether you looked into that report at all to see whether the recommendations by the auditor were followed or how they've been worked out. Um, I, I'll, I, no, I don't believe so. Uh, that would have been outside the scope of what our uh, what we were asked to do, but Sarah, I'm going to ask you to just confirm that because that was not my area. Uh, yeah, as far as I know, I mean, I'm sure that we read that report as background material as developing, but, you know, f um, the kind of tracking down the follow through was not within the scope of the project. Okay, thanks. Okay, I don't see any other questions. Uh, so 
last call for questions. We have just another couple of minutes. Seeing none, uh, Chair Emmons and Chair Grad, anything else you'd like to uh, add? Thank you, thank you. I'm really glad that, that our committees could all um, hear this together because um, it's, it's really excellent work and really, really appreciate council state governments. Um, I've heard this a number of times, but each time I hear it, um, I understand more because it's, it really is such a, a rich report. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And I second that. I want to thank all the work that the council's done. And I agree with Representative Grad. I mean, I've heard it many times, but each time you hear it, you pick up a little bit more and a little bit more that you can put the pieces together. So mm -hmm. I really appreciate your work. And this joint meeting, I think it's very helpful. So thank you. I agree. Um, I, I just want to say on behalf of Senator Sears, he made it very clear to us this morning, he's wanting to move forward, particularly on the behavioral health side of this. Um, so hopefully we'll be going forward on multiple tracks in both chambers. So thank you to everyone, especially David and, uh, and Sarah. And so we'll adjourn.